but we want to start today by bringing in a very special guest uh, from Kiwi Blog, uh, David Farah. David, good morning to you. Good morning. Thanks for being with us today, David. We really appreciate it. The reason we want to have a chat with you today is because, of course, Chris Luxon had his, I keep wanting to say State of the Union. It's just so ingrained in my head, the State of the Union, but it's the State, <laughs> state of the Damn Nation. US politics, yes. Yeah, damn you, USA, um, State of the Nation speech, and you are someone uh, who has worked with, working with, don't know what the current status is, but uh, national uh, politicians and politics in the National Party in the past before, very famously, I don't know whether it was their second or third win, but you know, John Key thanked you pretty much primarily being responsible for them winning one of those elections from the podium on election night. Um, it was basically no one else was available, just you as my camera ticks off there, but I'll fix that in a second. Uh, so I thought, David, to start off with, it would be um, nice just to kind of give you a couple of minutes to give us your thoughts on how you think the his first State of the Nation speech went. What do you think? Yeah, look, I thought it was very smart because I don't think there's any doubt that inflation cost of living is going to be a major issue post-COVID. Um, and what we don't know is will it be the issue for 12 months or 24 months. But if it's still going to be an issue come election time, Luxon set himself up as the guy who wants to give people more money after tax. And that's a good position to be having. Yeah, not everything the government controls. Petrol prices are mainly up due to the war in Ukraine. But let me tell sure. you, when people go and they're paying over $3 a litre, they don't care. They just want more money, so they have Ford to fill up their car. So I actually thought what Luxon did, which was quite small tax cuts, but just based on, look, we've got high inflation, so we'll just tax cuts, tax brackets to meet inflation. Yeah, it's actually quite hard to argue against that. Does the government really want to argue, no, no, we think inflation should push you up into more tax brackets so you pay more tax? Speaking of backgrounds, we've got a pretty good uh, grand grand panel in the background there with uh, with David. Uh, <laughs> and Nick. Let me ask you this, and Nick, you can jump in next for the next question. But let me ask you this: um, it felt a little bit to me like, and I don't mean this in a disrespectful way, but another boring old political speech where the the opposition from you are bad, and we've got all the answers, whilst not really giving any answers. Again not necessarily criticism of of national for that, but just it's it's sort of what it felt like poking the bone, pointing at all the things that Labour is supposedly doing wrong whilst not really giving anything for doing it and also ignoring the history of your own party. So I'll give you an exact example. He talked about the house uh, house prices going up by $400,000 under Labour. Uh, that is, from my reckoning, when I went and did the uh, work last night looking at the EINZ uh, data, an increase of 69% since Labour took over. Under the previous national government, it went up 63%. Yes, the number was smaller, but proportionally it was almost identical. I, I thought as well, one of the things I'd love to talk to you about is, do politicians know that we can look and see through the facade of these guys are terrible, we've got all the answers? Or does no one like, geeks like me actually do the research and they just hear four hundred thousand dollars it was actually 350 but we won't go there four hundred thousand dollars that's amazingly high these people are terrible without acknowledging that actually it was pretty much identical proportionally under the previous national government um i would just say on that data that there is a difference between a rise over nine years and a rise over four years mm -hmm. um etc mm -hmm. if you're comparing apples and apples look sure if we didn't have COVID. I think you would have got a different speech. But at the moment, people are so focused on COVID and cost of living. If National had come out and announced their housing policy, I presume they will have one, it would almost sink without trace. So I think what you're seeing is that National's decided we're going to hold back on major policy announcements except this tax cost of living one until... We're post-COVID. I'm not sure we'll ever be totally post-COVID, but, you know, over the hump of Omicron because people aren't wanting to actually hear about housing policy at the moment or education right. policy. They just want to get through this pandemic and get their life back to normal. In terms of, you know, 
do people listen and find their own data? Look, oppositions always point out how terrible it is and don't yeah. like talking don't. about when they're in government. Governments always talk about, oh, how terrible the last government is, nine long years, we need more time to fix it, even when they've been in for five years. So there's a you know, certain amount of um, theatrics that you always get yeah. with this. <laughs> yeah. Nick? Yeah, so I just, I guess, and, and that's a great point, David, over the last four years, but I would even go as far as that. It's not even been over the last four years. Um, it's probably been the last... 13 months <laughs> that it's just absolutely skyrocketed because i can just I just talk from personal experience so uh before covid um we were looking uh we sold our house to go over to sydney to live in to live in sydney because i was getting some work over there and because of covid had to come back so we were in the market for sort of eight eighty nine hundred thousand dollar houses so very lucky to be in a position where we could afford something like that and then we moved into a rental just to you know get by and then uh, the place that we're in at the moment went from 850 and now it's 1.35 uh, million. And so, and that's just gone in 12, 13 months. And so we were looking at properties like this to, to, you know, just to buy. So there's a, I guess there's a difference as well in terms of like, yeah, it was high to uh, two, three, four years ago, but it was still, if you, if you actually saved and, you know, uh, did the right things, you could still afford it. But now it's like, it's gone to the point where I know uh, a lot of younger people and um, family members, friends, all that kind of stuff, they're just sort of shrugging their shoulders now going, well, there's no way I can afford it. So I'm either going to gap it overseas uh, or um, I'm just going to... Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, or, yeah, yeah. Or Invercargill could see a, a, a bit of an influx. But listen, Labor's Labor's uh, housing policies haven't gone that well. Uh, Kiwi Build, you know, um, that kind of thing hasn't gone very well. That one that they did on the the Parliament grounds didn't go very well. That housed about two thousand people for a little yeah. while, <laughs> but <laughs> they didn't. They didn't. That didn't end, end very well. So it's it's. I think it was a smart thing, as David was saying. Like you know, people are wanting to get through this, and yeah, people don't care. People don't care how they've how they've got that extra money in their pocket. They just want to be able to afford it. Um, and unfortunately, I think Labor are losing some of their. Um, sort of core followers because um you know the the sort of lowest socioeconomic people who can who are like doing um uh, work that basically can uh, you need to you need to be in two or three different locations like cleaners or that kind of stuff they're absolutely getting rinsed couriers that kind of thing they're they're, they're getting absolutely wasted at the moment because of the am amount of uh, cost it is for, for petrol at the moment and um as David said, I know that you can't really control that because that's, there's a war going on. But you know, in Auckland, there is we're, we're paying taxes a lot higher than than some people around the country. Let me just jump in before we come back, yeah. David, because what I'm what I'm interested to really hear is also, and not from you, David, or, or you, Nick, but for, as you as you said, from National, is um, and I guess you've kind of answered this, David, by saying they're kind of keeping their powder dry on policy. That's what I hear you saying. Is that how are they going to both make housing more affordable? but also not drop the prices to all those people who are currently, you know, have a 95% mortgage are then in negative equity. And sometimes it feels like, and I've said this actually since I was on ZB 15 years ago, that the housing market's not really going to slow down because it's the supply and demand thing. Until our supply outweighs our demand, prices aren't going to tail the other way. And that still hasn't happened and there's no evidence of it happening anytime soon. David. Look, I don't think you can do both anymore. You either have to make it affordable uh, or you keep prices where they are. Governments mm. always thought the idea would be reduce price house inflation to like 1%. Then everyone would be happy, no one drops. But even if you froze house prices today, they're out of reach for people. So actually, it's going to be tough medicine. I think house prices will have to drop. Um, and some people who've just entered the market are going to get burnt. Um, mm. yeah, look, what's interesting is people will, you know, often said, Oh, the problem is too many immigrants are coming here pushing house prices up. We've had no immigrants for two years, no, exactly. and we've had mm. the highest price house inflation. You mm. need to do two things, I think. One is massively increase land supply for housing, 
in mm. Auckland, and this was Labor's policy in 2017, get rid of the rural urban boundary where prices are 14 times more on one side than the other. But mm. also I do think you need to look at taxation and you need incentives for people to build houses on land um, mm. and lots of them, not just to land bank. Yeah, very much. Hey, we've only got you for a few more minutes, so let's get to a couple of other things from the speech. Is there a, a danger in politics these days? Uh, again, it's not really a commentary necessarily on Mr Luxon, but on politics in general, especially politics on the right, of following the themes that uh, Mr Trump brought in a half dozen years ago by using tropes like socialism. Like Mr Luxon talked about socialism and talked about the evils of socialism. And I'm kind of going, look, I get that, people associate that with the left but what are the socialist like if mr luxon was sitting right here and frightening me right now i'd go what are the policies the socialist policies that you are really concerned about from this labor government because i i struggle to think of any genuinely real socialist policies is there a danger that um we have a time in politics now where tropes and memes are more important than sort of policy and I guess, quality thought through ideas, David. Yeah, look, there's been a trend that way for a very long time. Um, look, I think the socialist thing was a bit silly because what socialism means varies a lot to different people. Very broadly, centre-right people believe in smaller government. Uh, they believe in more individual control. They believe in lower taxes. And I think that's what Luxon was broadly pointing out. Um, specifically, I think he made the case that the job of welfare isn't to keep people on welfare in a really comfortable position for years and years, but to actually help move them off welfare. So that's perhaps a key defining issue. But, you know, it's hard to get a Cross complexity even in a speech so you do tend to go for slogans sure yeah yeah yeah. i guess so and one other thing i wanted to ask about was to i mean the uh oh, let me read out i'll read out the exact quote if i can find my notes there they are um talking about here it is i've actually got it on a page i'll bring it up for us all to see talking about it's and i'm not saying again this is not a criticism of, of the national party but it seems to be a left-wing right-wing thing that the right says the left is a nanny state and the left says uh you know i guess the right wants to use private business for everything he said in his speech uh whatever you call it labor has time and again shown us that it thinks it alone knows what's best for the Kiwis and their communities. They don't trust us to make decisions for ourselves and our families. They insist more and more things should be dictated by politicians and bureaucrats in Wellington. I simply do not agree. I, I guess there's a bit of a theme with one of my questions here, David, and it's similar to the idea of what we have done in the past. I mean, I actually agree with the way Mr. Luxon voted on the conversion bill. He, he said, you know, People shouldn't be allowed to be put through conversion. But if you wanted to be black and white about it, that's taking away the rights of parents to decide what's happening for their seven-year-olds in that instance. And whilst he wasn't in Parliament, he also said he wouldn't have supported the euthanasia bill if he had have been, which again was working against, you know, families making decisions for themselves. Is I guess what I'm saying is everyone has a line somewhere. And I'm I'm a bit of a purist that if you say something, you stand by it. And if you if you don't believe in that, you shouldn't use it as an example to potentially open yourself up to a sector of society saying, look at me, we're going to, we're, we're the freedom party, but not in this area. I, I guess just, have you got any comments on that? Well, look, look, at least you're a hardcore libertarian or a hardcore <laughs> <Marxist>. <laughs> there is, Everyone's always got, like, yeah. I believe in less control yeah. here, but they have areas. I actually read Luxon talking about that wasn't so much on social or moral issues, but if there's one thing you can say this government loves doing, it's centralising, it's abolishing 22 DHBs, it's abolishing local water, it's abolished control of local politics, because it does have a view that so the efficiency, if you get it, of central control is better. So I actually think Luxon wasn't talking so much on euthanasia. I think he was talking about the 
the, the centralization and that's probably going to be one of the other big platforms going into the election I think for national is saying Labour's taking power away from you and your community doesn't mean yes it's going to become a libertarian paradise under national though because mm. uh, I know the obvious thing question is well if we want to make decisions for ourselves you're like I'm, I'm assuming therefore they're going to be pro legalizing of cannabis and you know all these things as well because someone can make that decision for themselves so yeah I hear what you're saying although he does say it does say very clearly about decisions for ourselves and our families. It doesn't necessarily feel like abolishing DHBs. It does feel more personal. But again, as you say, it's hard to be maybe precise in your first speech. Maybe those will become more evident over the forthcoming months before the next election. Yeah, look, the first speech is talking more values than specific policies. Yeah, right. And he's trying to say generally when things come to push, we're more likely to be on the side of families deciding, communities deciding, than the central government deciding. But of course, not for everything, because um, there was a great quote in the West Wing where Jed Bartlett, you know, debated a governor who was all about states' rights. And, you know, he said, look, when we fought in World War II, we didn't go in as Florida. We fought as the United States of America. And, mm. you know, likewise, you know, we, we don't want uh, local police forces. We don't want um local defense force so it's always mm. nuanced to a degree david thanks for joining us today really appreciate you giving us a, a few minutes of your time uh kiwi blog if people want to find out more about your writings and 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 meanderings and are you and and uh i guess that i was going to ask you about your business and about what you're doing with the national party but i won't ask you that because it's probably an inappropriate question and it's probably <laughs> uh, industry industry sensitive so i won't ask you that at all i'll just go <laughs> thanks david for coming i really appreciate it <laughs> Your insights, mate. All the best.